Now, for our last session of the day, and I know we're running a few minutes late, but don't worry, lunch will wait, uh, we have the man who needs no introduction, Terry Kawaja and his shoes. Terry? <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Listen, nobody appreciates a full room more than a comedian. I mean, a banker, uh, a comedian, a banker. Yes, you get it. Um, we're bringing it home here, and uh, I think what you're going to find, what I'm going to try and do is, um, is, is tie together a lot of the themes, a lot of the things that we heard about today, starting from what uh, Brian talked about in terms of the focus of where uh, digital and where display is moving, all the way through to um, the most recent presentation on uh, similarities and differences, and talk about my uh, presentation is, is was when, when Brian and Michael asked me to talk about mobile uh, here, um, I, uh, I said, great, but the title of it really ought to be the future of digital advertising, because I think that's exactly the case. But the question does remain, why are you listening to an investment banker uh, at an advertising conference? After all, we are the class of people responsible for a global financial meltdown at such cataclysmic scale that it called into very, uh, that it called our whole capitalist system into question. I mean, who could possibly, who has less credibility than bankers? Uh, <laughs> Comedy is all about timing. But, um, <laughs> Kim Jong-un, we've got to get this thing working. Um, Kim Jong-un uh, was not available, and I'm pretty sure uh, Brian tried. Actually, uh, I think he's on the uh, exhibit, uh, exhibition floor at AdTech. Um, <laughs> but, but, but listen, this is, this is an important um, issue because on Wall Street, if you come from Wall Street, you actually have to unlearn some of the things they teach you. I remember day one at, at uh, Solomon Brothers, many moons ago now, uh, the very first thing they taught us was something called the red suit rule. And the red suit rule stood for the proposition that if a client wants a red suit, sell them a red suit. Don't tell them it'll look ridiculous in a red suit. Do not get in the way of revenue. Just give him what he's asking for. Well, we at Luma think that is entirely wrong. We're definitely against the red suit rule. Besides, there's not that many people that, you know, look good in a red suit. <coughs> but of course... There's always exceptions, though. always exceptions. Um, maybe next year, I don't know. You know what, it would be orange, though. Um, so, uh, great. Uh, I think the, the, when, when we talk about where things you know, are moving, what I want you guys to conclude with at the end of this is a notion similar to what Brian talked about, which is mobile is not different. I'm not sure we'll be calling it mobile or mobile. I'm not sure the word will come up because it's the future of digital advertising. So it almost becomes irrelevant. The mobile, here's the prediction, in five years, there will be no mobile Lumascape. I'm not sure there'll be one in three years. It's irrelevant. It's just the future of digital advertising. You're familiar with, uh, you may be, um, this uh, document. And of course, now there's uh, a lot of them. We did them for search and for video and for mobile, obviously, social, commerce, gaming. And a new one you're just getting a peek at, uh, unpublished, is the Marketing Technology Lumiscape. Here's what's going on. It's not just about advertising. There's all kinds of targeting and optimization technology that is being leveraged in advertising, but guess what? It's also moving to the website. And as we'll uh, talk about further, uh, I think the whole definition of what we're doing here is it should really be a full funnel approach. So yes, it's advertising, but that's just on their way down to commerce. So the connection with commerce is really, really important. And as Brian pointed out earlier, the other takeaway, so one is maybe it's not ad tech, maybe it's MarTech. That'll be the new uh, uh, catchphrase. And the second is that in this environment, in this more mobile prone media consumption and, and uh, and uh, commerce opportunity that we're moving into, the consumer is in control. And so that brings about opportunities and challenges, which we'll go through. So um, yeah, we, so we mapped all these players, great. Um, and then we did something fun last year. We, uh, we mapped the buyers. We turned the tables and mapped all the buyers in, uh, uh, that are actually doing all the, uh, doing all the work. 
uh, buying these companies and looking at technologies to build um, their businesses. And this has been fun, by the way, to get the feedback on uh, some of these guys, because they'll, they'll call and say, hey, you have us on the vast way out here in the outer ring, it, it, but we have you know, huge uh, digital plans uh, that we intend to make acquisitions, to which we say, come on in, let's talk about it. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, Introducing the greatest lead generation um, uh, thing ever, effort ever. So, um, and, and by the way, if you uh, were to think of this in terms of a marketplace, you've got buyers and sellers, and if you looked at the last few years, it would look something like this. There you go. Um, all summarized for you, better than Excel format. So um, last month, or two months ago now, uh, the IEB came out with a new graphic. They called it the Digital Advertising Arena. And uh, this, they said, was going to be a, a better way to project the ecosystem than that silly one that they didn't refer to by name. And so, um, and, and, and by the way, the, the, the whole point was they said, uh, this is more of an emphasis on brand. They put brand in the center you know, of the circle. And they said, that does a better job about talking about brands than the Lumascape. I said, believe me, we understand about branding. It is called the Lumascape. Um, but, but I don't think this is a competitive thing. It's not one or the other. I mean, we can use whatever tools that we think we should use. Besides, the Lumascape is really just made for corporate development. And by the way, um, since announcing uh, the, uh, one big issue uh, that I have with the circle, uh, and I love you know, all formats, but there's one thing missing in that graphic. You know what that thing is? The consumer. And I don't know, or a consumer, user, however you want to put it, there is no future of digital, whether advertising or marketing, that doesn't need to have the consumer as part of the equation. So since uh, announcing the death of the Lumascape, let's see, we've had 33,000 views and downloads, so I don't quite think that's going to happen. But um, let's, uh, let's talk about a little bit about the ecosystem of today and then talk about the future. So obviously, we've got a lot of players and, you know, it's really not as complicated as it first looks. Everyone says, my god, the Lumascape is this convoluted, fragmented environment. Well, it's just a factual representation of the actual companies in the space, with one exception. Uh, I didn't make up any companies. Um, but if you boil it all down, it's really kind of simple, right? Ignore all those companies. And by the way, I was at a presentation at a um, large uh, uh, strategic in this space and uh, who, who will go unnamed in Sunnyvale. Um, and uh, I was talking about, I showed the Lumascape and I said, yeah, but let me help you out. And the, one of the comments was, good Lord. Uh, she said, uh, there's just so many companies in this space. And I said, yeah, but hang on, let me do this. And I filtered it for companies greater than 50 million of net revenue. Let me tell you something, it's a very, very different looking page. Um, so that is something, and it's much more simple than it at, uh, in first, of course, looks. So um, th there are issues. Uh, some of the things uh, Brian, when he opened this morning, he talked about some of these issues. The fragmentation of the ecosystem, the, the emphasis on point solutions instead of you know, integrated uh, approach, where everyone's optimizing within their own um, silos. Clearly, we've got some value leakage that needs to be fixed. And of course, let's face it, there's a 8,000 pound gorilla in the room. There is a perception that there is an over-reliance on the big G. Well, um, let's talk about solutions. Uh, and again, uh, I think we, uh, Brian did a good job this morning of, of hinting at some of the things we're likely to see. Uh, amalgamation, bringing together some of these capabilities, obviously multi-channel. Uh, standardization and consolidation, to name a few. In fact, I'm going to pick three of them and talk about them. So uh, in reverse order, consolidation. A few years ago, I said consolidation is really just less logo. So consolidation can happen one of two ways, M&A or failure. Well, let's take a look at both. In M&A land, we did an interesting uh, exercise. We took a look at the Lumascape as it existed in December 2010 and compared it to the Lumascape in December of 2012. Well, as it turns out, while there are like 300 some odd companies, there were approximately 200 companies, 204 independent companies in December 2010. And in that intervening two year period, we had 53 companies get acquired. You know, at first blush, two years, 25% consolidation of an industry. Sounds pretty good. 
bad part was 74 new ones popped up. So ladies and gentlemen, we have a case of Lumiscape uh, whack-a-mole. One down, others up. So, so that's not going to clear it out for us. The other way, as I said, is failure. And listen, we're off to a good start this year. In January, Adbright went out of business. Quadrant One was shuttered in February. And Adify closed its doors in March. I say that's a good start. Listen, nothing against the investors. And Adify had an exit before it closed down. Nothing against the investors here, but it's necessary, right? It's that Darwin lives everywhere, and we need fewer players. We need scaled players. We need uh, integration of, of technology. So with, there's still a few days left in April. We'll see who's next. Um, and as Brian also referenced, and we heard more about today in terms of the, uh, uh, the app marketplace, what we really need in this industry, the problem is not so much fragmentation. The real problem is duplication. All these different companies building their own tech stacks, building their own marketing, building their own APIs, building their own very, very duplicative uh, uh, technologies and capabilities. Imagine if we had the efficiency in this industry that, are, that, that exist in other industries where we had an OS. One, you know, or not one, but a, a few players that had a platform upon which other companies could build their capabilities. Think about it, how much more efficient it would be if all the companies in the space didn't have to raise $50 million, but instead focus on what they do really well and then rely on a partner to give them that kind of scale. Well, you know, uh, we're here for a reason. I'm talking about this for a reason. AppNexus is doing exactly that. Um, and unlike Google, they're not player coach. So uh, that, I think, is an important issue addressing the Google Reliance issue. So, so that's consolidation and standardization. Let's talk about multi-channel. Uh, I think, again, as I said, you know, there's differences between channels and formats. And you know, display, mobile really is display. It's just, it's just on, on different devices. And by the way, we're going to have all kinds of different devices, whether we call them you know, iPads or phones or, or, or what's the new phablets is the new uh, mix. And then there's obviously you know, video. And, and, and then, of course, there's the combination of uh, mobile video. But I want to focus about uh, talk about mobile. Obviously, we've seen huge growth in eyeballs. People are really moving to the mobile channel as they live with that media consumption and commerce enablement device 24-7. Uh, uh, as we heard, it's primarily about apps. This does, these, are, these do have important implications in terms of how people will play in it uh, because it sets up a different uh, competitive dynamic uh, when you have concentration. If you were to look at the revenue concentration of the top five publishers in display, this is the desktop, you'll see some um, interesting things. Obviously, uh, it's reasonably consolidated with the top five having 50% of the display uh, revenue. You then go to mobile, and it's actually much, much greater. 74% of all dollars, non-search, non-search, display dollars are, are earned by only five companies. Here's some interesting things to look at. Facebook and Google increasing share. And then look where they're getting it from. Even the other three are, are declining. Second, in mobile, Facebook is now the number one revenue share of mobile ads from zero two years ago. That has a pretty big implication, and obviously uh, the concentration. So this is a different environment, and it requires you know, different um, strategies. Uh, Facebook. You know, uh, just announced last week they're home because they know that's where the consumers are and that's where they uh, want to play. They want to sort of be in front of that OS. And look, it's understandable why they want to do this because they want access to that data. They want access to that consumer. Well, by the same token, I suppose anybody could launch, you know, a phone um, introducing maybe an idea, the App Nexus phone. Um, you know, it could it could do a lot for for the business, but ultimately, I think people might be worried about who's looking at their data. Um, <laughs> and besides, what would you call it? The Ophony? No, no, no. Ophone, the Ophone. Works on so many levels. Um, just kidding, I, my friend Brian. Um, so, and, you know, this is, um, this is a big issue in particular, 
If that concentration is happening in mobile, because remember, again, as Brian referenced, we've got some challenges uh, on the display side with the loss of third-party uh, cookie uh, data. We've seen uh, IE10, uh, you know, kill the DNT or send the DNT signal. We've seen Mozilla take another bite out of the cookie by, in fact, absolutely blocking um, the signal. And so, ultimately, uh, I think people will conclude that you know, first-party cookies are much tastier. But take that. In you know together with that increasing uh, um, uh, concentration in a mobile environment, and that sort of is an issue that the industry will have to deal with. So let's talk about the ecosystem um, of the future. Um, uh, referencing uh, Mary Meeker's slide again, the difference between time spent and ad dollars pretty significant. And guess what? It's made up the gap. We're at 26 to 22, so it's all but made up. And everyone five years ago used to say, "Wait till digital branding comes to." To, uh, to, to online. Well, it made it up, but there's still no brand advertising. And I think we're going to talk about sort of one of the, some of the reasons why. Uh, and, and the primary one is that I, what I would suggest is that the, the interruptive media, which is the premise of traditional advertising, uh, is not native, if you will, to digital. Let's say there is some content that you want to feast your eyes on. Um, OK, uh, for the ladies in the room, um, there we go. Um, you know, some really good content that you're uh, looking at, and yet here comes this ad that just, you know, gets in your way, that interrupts your uh, flow. It's not, it's not particularly uh, conducive, in particular when you consider consumer modalities. It really matters, right? In, in entertainment world, we're watching TV, we're sitting back, maybe we're more upright on the PC, but on the mobile phone, we're on the go, we're active. This is, it's our doing device. And so how the advertiser interacts with the consumer is fundamentally different. Remember back in 2003, those annoying pop-ups? You had to go and find the little red dot and get rid of the damn thing so you could see your content? Well, they're back. It's just called a welcome screen. Um, and notice that nobody's button to continue to your content is greater than eight point font. Um, you really got to search for it. But we do. And you know what? We're just annoyed, mildly annoyed for a few seconds until we click that off. Well, um, that's interesting. We're mildly annoyed. Once we get to our content, there's banners. But let's face it, what you see, what we all see when we look at this is this. It's banner blindness. And by the way, to, uh, to get to the heat map idea, you like the heat map, uh, Brian? This is effectively what we see. We see the content. We don't see the banners. So we've got interruptive welcome screens. We've got banner blindness. Now move to a mobile phone. There's less real estate. There's less opportunity to have that kind of interruptive experience. And thank God, because could you imagine if, if you're annoyed by interruptive media on, online, you are intolerable of it um, in a mobile environment because that's your doing device. It's an intimate device and you want to accomplish things with it. So that's not the way forward, I don't think, for uh, branding in a mobile context. And maybe it doesn't have to be, because it, as it turns out, the mobile channel, the mobile device, is a phenomenal conversion mechanism. There's way too much talk in this industry about DR, you know, it, it's sort of, you know, people liken it to the late night, infomer late night infomercials or the crappy ads at the back of the magazine. Well, the reality is in digital, DR is not a bad thing. In fact, it's a great thing because ultimately advertising is all about driving consumption, right? It's about an action. And, and as it turns out that the mobile device is a phenomenal conversion mechanism. The stats are off the charts and they eclipse the uh, click through and conversion rates in an online sense by, by multiples. Because let's face it, you are number one, remember that consumer modality? You're in action mode when you're on your phone. So you're accomplishing things, you're doing things, you're buying things, you're visiting things. Number two, it's fully capable both online and offline. You convert online, you can convert offline two ways. Make a phone call, visit a store. And I can pretty much guarantee that if any of you have made a significant purchase in the last 12 months, you've done it with your phone within two feet. So, and, and by the way, you know, it's much, much bigger than display. The whole display industry, sub 50 billion. Well, if you look at e-commerce, it's several hundred billion. And all retail, which is basically the opportunity, Four and a half trillion dollars. Feast your eyes on those kind of numbers, Jackie. 
I mean, that's, that's, some, that's some big, uh, big stuff. So fine, it's a great conversion mechanism, but how do we brand? Um, it is a little different, and I think, we think it, it, it requires three things. Number one, contextual relevance. Again, the consumer is in control. They want it to be a friendly environment. Second of all, engagement. It's a great uh, conversion mechanism, so enable them to do things with that interaction. And third is facilitation. Do not block them, but rather enable people to accomplish what they were otherwise trying to do. So we've heard a lot about native, right? There's people have written about it, you know, what is native? It certainly involves some kind of in-stream or content-related, you know, messaging uh, by marketers. We certainly know uh, that that's not native. Uh, and don't worry, I'm an equal opportunity offender. Uh, it's comedian first, banker second. Um, and uh, and there, are, there are cautionary uh, things about, about native, right? You can't have an experience that's unfriendly to the consumer. This is a l real page grab from a colleague's Facebook. And look, it's mostly ads. And, and the, on the, in the phone, it's even, it's even worse, where there's too much you know, in your stream of the marketing message and less um, about the content. Um, and ultimately, you know, the consumers can uh, install software and get rid of it altogether. So, I think we have to be facilitative, we have to be consumer friendly. Last week, the Weather Channel came up with their new app, and here's a campaign by uh, Jeep. It's a, it's, a, it's a great example of a consumer friendly application. Remember the three things, contextual relevance, the background screen of the creative changes with the weather. Okay, so if it's cloudy day, it shows up in a cloudy day. If it's nighttime, it's nighttime. So there's contextual relevance. Of course, there's an engagement uh, capability. And most interesting, the ad is in the background. You went there to get the weather, you still got it. All the data is in the front. So it doesn't necessarily have to follow that exact format. I'm just giving that as an example. Enable people, facilitate them um, in a digital context. So here's the money slide, folks. We're coming to the end. Um, what does it look like? This is not a Lumiscape, but just thinking about how we evolve, we had hand-sold premium inventory, right, from the top publishers. Then, uh, as we heard earlier this morning, we saw the development of hand-sold remnant inventory, uh, enabling, you know, smaller publishers and aggregating. Then, we, of course, we saw the world evolve in the sort of automation or programmatic world where a lot of people focused on these more efficient uh, exchange-based uh, marketplaces. And then finally, we now have seen an emergence of a, something that's less, uh, more amorphous, more nascent. I'll call it native slash social, but it's, it's, it's uh, content that engages the consumer, many of which uh, doesn't necessarily utilize advertising in the, in the traditional sense. And and, and interestingly and importantly, per my earlier comments, the, the relation to commerce. So as it turns out, and there's different, there's different you know, advertiser objectives. One is more you know, um, direct response oriented, the other more brand. But they all connect to commerce. So programmatic connects to commerce, retargeting, right? Pretty clear. Uh, uh, the other side, the native social side, connects to commerce a couple different ways. Integrated models like Fab. If I said to you, is Fab a content company or a commerce company? The answer is yes. And then also uh, like Bizarre Voice with, uh, with reviews. So there is that nice connection to commerce, which again, I think is going to be more and more important as we think of this as marketing technology, not necessarily just advertising. And for the big guys, they're going to have to enable themselves, both with automation and with this new, more consumer-friendly environment. And by the way, the nirvana is if you can get right at the middle, right? If you can bring programmatic scale to uh, to content, because a lot of that content stuff is one-off and it feels like an agency, there's not a lot of duplication. So let's talk about that, let's talk about enablement. We are here, after all, at the App Nexus Summit. And think about their position in this ecosystem and how they help enable. And I'll give you four examples, big, medium, and small. Well, obviously, you're familiar with their relationship with Microsoft, uh, and they uh, monetize much of their inventory. But likewise, CPX Interactive, built a great uh, ad network, a um, lot of clients, the whole move towards programmatic, and they sit there and say, how do we play in that game? Should we duplicate AppNexus's effort? Should we you know, invest and raise a whole bunch of more money and dilute themselves? Hell no, they're smart. They partner with AppNexus so that they basically get the same advantages as 
uh, if they had spent that money only without all that unnecessary dilution. And then Schenectady, another company that does a lot of cool, rich media uh, uh, engagements, they leverage the scale that AppNexus uh, brings. So that's sort of how they play a central role in what I think is a much more you know, interesting future um, of digital advertising. With that, I thank you.